So welcome, welcome. We're here to mark the completion of a 10-year project, the Quran, the eternal light of the Quran. And this is a new, it's a new, new way of looking through the Quran at the reality that it came from the reality that is behind it. And uh, rather than go into the different features of the book, uh, we want to just have an informal conversation amongst the three of us who were involved in this production. And of course, uh, Leah Kala was also involved as the, our main project manager. So Sheikh now welcome, welcome. Welcome, Adnan. Uh, we'd like to, you know, today, you know, look at certain issues that the whole, uh, what we call the TQ project, the Quran project, like the Quran has brought up. And these are issues that we can consider as, it's a issues that change generation by generation, and also asking the question, what remains the same? You know, what is the, what is this eternal light of the Quran, the newer from which everything comes, uh, from which everything comes throughout the whole of, you could say, the Abrahamic tradition, as well as the, say, the light of wisdom that has come actually through all traditions, as the Quran is quite clear about where it says we have sent all people's prophets at all times, implying that even uh, different uh, animals and birds in nature have their own prophets and have their own messengers. So if this light is always remaining the same, which is one of the main messages of the Quran, how do we present it? How do we open its doors better for each generation? I think that's been one of our main questions as we long through this long. It seems, seems to be long. For, for me, it's not long at all. It seems like we could do another 10 years. Why <laughs> not? <laughs> but we want to bring something out now so that people, you know, can, can access it. Um, Sheikh Fulal, you know, what would you, what, what would you like to offer to you? What, what has been your intention for this project from the start? From yeah. well, my childhood, I grew up in an ambience, in an atmosphere that there were a lot of fine, quality, sincere, serious people who wanted to live the, the map of reality so that there is no suffering, there is no confusion, so there is ease of the journey on earth. So my interest has always been that. I don't want to suffer, I don't want to regret, I don't want to have any discord to you. So I want to have a situation where I have a reference as to whether A or B, whether I could do it or I couldn't do it. Whether choices and so the illusion of freedom cause much more harm than we ever can imagine. And on top of it is the illusion that we are seeking happiness, whatever that means. So I was very fortunate in Growing up in an ambience that the real you is a soul, is a spirit, is a ruh, and that is incomprehensible for the mind. And it is eternal and it is boundless and it is the source of your life, which is uh, never ending. So you have to live that. And my attempt has always been to live as a ruh, without denying its shadow, the self, the ego, the lower nefs. The animal self. This has been evolving over billions of years. And then within the last 50, 100, 200,000 years, suddenly the flowering of this entity, the human being, brought us to a point where any reflective being, any thinker, would come to the conclusion there must be a divine presence within me to lift me up all the time to the highest level of course. So and I see it in the Quran throughout, and even all the so-called tests and trials, as the Quran says it, in eight, nine different ayahs, la Allahum yarjaun, so you return back. Back to what? To the pattern of truth, to the pattern that we have been designed to embrace with love, affection, honesty, and diligence. 
I think what uh, we have enjoyed between ourselves the last few years is how to make this amazing gift of the Quran accessible in our culture in today's world. Because cultures change, languages change, and yet the language of the Quran appears to be the same, but we have to apply it to a different you know, way of life, to different people. People nowadays are not the same as they were 200 years ago, and so on and so on. So it was an attempt to get nearer, because God is the nearest of nearness itself. So this is the unveiling of the truth of it. So we like to get it nearer and nearer until you have no problem. You're alive here, wonderful. You have left your body, wonderful. You have moved into another zone of consciousness. That is infinite and it's natural. It's a natural flow. So we must live according to the nature that has cracked into all kinds of spirits and beings and entities as well as rocks. So it's a wonderful gift of ours. Mm. And the treasure is, is to look upon it, uh, reflect it, discuss it, and live by it joyfully. Mm. So I am really privileged. I can not begin even to express gratitude. And I'm also most, most, most delighted to have you and a few others around us as two friends that our main connectedness is the infinite divine presence. So that's what that presence will bring us into a level of super efficiency and honesty and reality and that's it. If you have done that, then death becomes the gateway of a celebration for something higher. Otherwise it's bleak and misery and is the end the end end of what? Truth has no end. The light in your heart has no end. What has a beginning and an end is the cycle of the shadow. There is a birth and there is a death. Cycle of reality. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Adnan, you, you've also been involved from the very beginning and were involved in uh, reworking the all these translations that we've had over more than a hundred years into a new translation. And I'm wondering if you have any reflections or, you know, what, what, what do you feel is your intention for this project and for whoever, in whoever's hands this, in this particular book might, might find itself. Uh, as Sheikh Fadlullah said, I mean, this, uh, it's really how do we convey, understand, interact with this amazing reality? This is, I mean, especially the Quran is the, we can say, is the book of reality. Not just it's reflecting, it's uh, the meaning, intention of the divine source, but also the, the, the realities of this life, the, the heavenly, the earthly, and the, especially the human. So how do we we able to? It's not just a matter of translating uh, from one language to the others. Even inter I mean, we have so many interpretations within the same Arabic. How comes that? Because if it's the uh, the, uh, the diversity of the human receptor of it, the male multiple understandings. There's context of its time of the revelation itself. This has a specific language. That language evolves. It has different. Uh, uh, context according to the uh, uh, the mindset of the time. How we understand it now, is it the same how they understand it a thousand years ago? Unlikely. So how do you get that balance? So the, it's a book, it's a written book, but has a literal uh, meaning, but also has multiple contexts. So how do we strike that balance? It's always been a challenge. You know? And uh, as Sheikh Mullah said, it's how do you get, has, uh, has both intentions, has both also multiple voices. It's not like one voice says, Allah says, Allah says. No, there are multiple voices. Sometimes it's the angels, sometimes it's the lower, sometimes it's the higher, sometimes it's the voice of the absolute, sometimes it's absolute truth, la ilaha illallah. And sometimes it is just basics of, you know, a camel or, or, a, or, a, or a certain type of, a, uh, a palm tree. What's the significance of those? And there are amazing stories. There are 
poetic nuances, there are synonyms, there are all these types of things. So how do we bring that treasure out? So it's like, uh, you know, it's uh, reflecting the divine. I was a hidden treasure and I would like to be known. Same as the Quran is the same. It's a treasure. And how do we read reality and also ourselves in it? Ultimately, it's the book of reality means the book of the human being. In Zola's dimension, there's the timeless spiritual dimension interacting with this temporal, uh, biological, chemical, and all that. So, so such an amazing, really, treasure. And it's our job in order is, is to interact with it. And it's a dynamic living book. It's not a, a fixed thing. And so, really, that is the both the beauty and the challenge of, of the project. It is, it is, it continues to be challenging, um, even though we, so to speak, finished, we complete for now. Uh, these, as we've indicated, us uh, non, uh, non these things are never really complete. And it's fixed what all of us talking about earlier, perhaps, really needs to be done every generation uh, in a certain way. It's, you know, my small bit of this was, you know, advising somewhat on the context of the of the ancient Abrahamic languages, the so-called Semitic languages, and and the way that you know they they present a unique opportunity for the the light of unity to be seen through particular words. And yet at the time of Prophet Muhammad and certainly before his time, the whole notion of any literal translation was unknown. You could never translate an ancient Semitic language even the word nur, uh, just into one one meaning that would be fixed as a particle, so to be using particle language. It's more like the meanings sort of stack up, they layer. And the Semitic languages are unique in this, although I would say, you know, from the little that I know of other ancient languages, they also have this ability to reflect the inner and the outer. So we find that for almost anything that we consider as an abstract quality or attribute or idea that we might find in the Quran. There was also originally in the Arabic, there was a very material, what we would call material perception of it also. So it was both an outer and an inner. And so it's constantly shifting back and forth. And this is what I found as I was going to take Palala's commentaries, which are, I would say, uh, the major feature of the book, various commentaries, on various ayat, ayah, various surahs, and like this, in that I found myself continually, no matter what the Quran was speaking on, I, I keep circling back to what uh, we call unity tafi, so this this presence, this light that is always there. And it doesn't matter if someone's talking, if, if the verse is talking about a camel, or this person's dispute with this person, or what are we going to do with this or that, it, it all, from the outer circles back to the inner and then unites it all, or inner to the outer and unites it all. And this is a, a, a very beautiful thing about the Quran. Uh, it continually does that. So, you know, it's, it's a great blessing to be able to offer something for this generation. And uh, my main feeling, my intention, hope is that it finds its way into the hands of whoever can benefit, whoever already has some inkling, some some feeling of that spark of light within them. And if they bring that to their reading of you could say of what what is here, uh, they they will find new doorways, new windows, and also support for what they've already you could say felt as a as an inkling of that light. And we do find more and more people today uh, from whatever path of life, in religion or not in religion, uh, finding their their way somehow. I think what the the path, the, you could say the this path offers, the Muhammadi path, you could call it, or the this path of the Abrahamic traditions, what they offer is that you don't have to completely reinvent the wheel. In fact, you don't have to reinvent the wheel at all. You've got a wheel, you've you've got a method, you've got a rhythm of life, a way of approaching life that is that is infinitely useful. And very practical for today. There's a, at least 20, 30, 40 
words in the Quran that are key words that are this that were the same for Prophet Isa, for Jesus, that were the same in the previous uh, Hebrew scripture tradition. And so people were always being circled back to this unity through these these key words and and a simple way of devotion, a simple way of of living. Uh, so it's over the centuries, of course, these things become very, very complex in people's minds. So we have different sorts of ideas, which are sometimes called theology, sometimes called tradition, sometimes called by other names. And and so we 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 human beings tend to get very tangled in our minds. Well, that's that's the world that we live in, and that's the way that we develop. We developed in this more particularized and more and more individualized form, more outer, more outer, more more individual, more outer, and so on. So how do we bring that, you could say, that development back now into this light of unity that the Abrahamic traditions, if you want to call them that, presented from, well, at least, I mean, at least the last six or 10,000 years, I would say, depending on when you believe the first stories were told. You know, uh, Jake Lalali, you were raised with much of this in your family. So you were raised sort of immersed in the wind, you could call it, which is sometimes called the Sharia. Uh, and as you pointed out in one of your books, it was almost as though yeah. both uh, the idea of this way and the practical living of it came together as a package. And with, you could say, family breaking down, community breaking down today, do you see that there's a way for people to find their way back to, to something like a healthy, healthy way, a healthy practice, a healthy, healthy way of life, a Sharia, for today? Not so long as there is duality, and that's where we are. We are in a zone of consciousness <clears throat> based on duality, beginning and up, down, sleep, away, living, dead, and so on. This is where we are. The Sharia of our consciousness is based on duality. And uh, the environment I grew up with is taking cognizance of this. He wants something, he doesn't want something. He, he's coming, he's going accepting the facts of space and time and a movement or an event within space and time and accepting that that base of duality of events within space and time can change. So the need for acceptance of a stabilizing Sharia is deep in us. The so-called haqiqa or truth is also a sharia, but it's a permanent sharia. It is eternal. We all want wealth. It's a, it's a real truth because we love the ever you know, wealthy, al ghani, or the ever able, or the ever knowing, al alim, al alim. So, sharia and haqiqa are completely enmeshed together. Except that the outer Sharia changes as the day changes. The Sharia for a day of wind and rain is for, for it to be a protection. The Sharia for a calm, beautiful, pleasant day of you know pleasant temperature, pleasant breeze is for it that you can be in, you can be out, you can be in between. So we are bracketed by the absolute. And the relative. Now, the relative was made into a cultural norm. Mm -hmm. And that is how, at the time, when there, there were no decent laws 2,000 years ago. Or if there was a Roman law, for example, very lopsided. Uh, there was no consideration of women and so on. So, at that time, the communal a law that is 
enables people to, to live in a reasonably stable situation with expectation of each other or the neighbors or the next country was needed. You know, and that gave rise to more and more and more over hundreds of years of understanding, treat others as we would like to be treated, you know, and so on. Be fair, be, and that has have, have longevity in it, if you are just, if you are accountable, if you are honest, if you So it ended up by having what we have nowadays as civil law. It's a big, big movement. If you look at civil law now and compare it to what there was a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, you know, it, there was nothing. So I think we are in a stage now that we take it for granted that outer Sharia, outer laws, human laws, has been in a way accepted globally. That you can't do this. This is unfair. This is genocide. This is against human rights. This and so on. So the focus will be more and more upon your inner state, your intention, your honesty, your willingness to stop. You know, if you are not willing to stop, then your action will be extreme. You know, because you are hanging on air. You are in an uncertainty zone where the only thing is happening is you are breathing in and out and in and out and it may stop. So, if you want to recalibrate your actions or the extent of your enthusiasm, to stop it. Be willing to give it up. Then it will calibrate itself. Then it won't become extremist. You see. It's natural for us to condone enthusiasm, continuity, perseverance. But equally, you know, in order to recalibrate to the zone of continuity, eternity, which is the divine presence. Willingness to give him up, thank you very much, I couldn't do it. Without anger, without rank. So, Aqeeq and Sharia are, are, at this time we are, we are living in, are clearly inseparable. Sharia is your accountable any minute by everyone. Why did you use it? Why did you favor this rather than that? If you are crazy, you're doing it to re-establish a certain balance. It's necessary. Good. Nature is balanced. It balances itself in hundreds of ways. Cyclical. Every second, every minute, every day, every year, every other 50 years, 70 years, and so on and so on. So it is the acceptance of it that gives us that genuine contentment and inherent joyfulness. So Sharia is necessary, but also Khafeta is also has got its own Sharia. We can't deny it. We can't. We all long for the attributes. We all long for the divine attributes because they are transmitted from our own ruh, our own soul, transmitting these attributes, and the shadow, the dark shadow, is also there, yeah. which are which are the lower side, the lower self ego, and so on which we despise and we suffer from. But they're there. It cannot be light without its shadow on this reality as well. And the absolute is something else. I can't tell about that. <laughs> I am in duality. <laughs> there is light. My access to the light in this zone of reality is through the shadow. It's through the shadow I know that that's where the light comes. And oh, that's where also the light comes. And as well as from here, there is only light. It's through the shadow that I discover Allah Nur Samawat. And it all takes true honesty, humbleness, presence, and the willingness to lose it. Because at the moment you are connected to a true, this amazing faculty of intellect, which is mental. What if you have no mind? We long for deep sleep during the time there is. Mind is not functioning. So we're putting things in perspective, and then you end up by total trust, which was the same thing at the beginning. Total trust. And the fetus grew by that trust. And a program that's not visible, not seen, genetic, subgenetic, and higher. Until such time says, Subhanallah. 
Allah is in the infinite unseen and in the most, most, most noticeable seeing. Where is it? So you really entered into a zone of utter security, not relative security. And that's what we are seeking in this world. Is it more insured? Is it better? Is it suffering? We are driven to be at one with absolute security, which is the nature of our own soul or spirit. In fact, the soul or the spirit is beyond this idea of secure or insecure, beyond the idea of happy or unhappy. It's in another zone of consciousness where these dualities don't arise. Our zone of the duality has emerged from that. And yearning back to that, that's what we are yearning. That's why most people, when they are given all of the other things they're looking for, they start being upset and angry. They have no cause now to fight for. It becomes bleak. But the truth is not bleak. It is cosmically celebratory. It is what it is. <laughs> and the so-called you is only a blip of a light to witness. Inna arsalna tashahidan. The prophetic state is to witness. And then with that witnessing, you're bewildered as to magnificent of it. So it says, Wabashiran, give the good news. There is only Allah. Infinite varieties, known and unknown. And if you don't see them and celebrate them and accept them and embrace them and enter into the only path, which is submission and acceptance, then nadir, you'll suffer. And you'll make everything around you suffer and die. And you'll be rejected and nothing will be remembered. And then if, if you are only within yourself, by yourself, unto yourself, celebrate the presence of the divine whose life is also transmitted from your own heart. Da'ayan illallah by permission of that magnificent you know, controller of it, governor of it. And then the end of that ayah was Siraj al Munir, illumined life. You have discovered that there's only Allah from beginning to end and in between and high. And, and you are here by virtue of that grace. You've been given whatever is being given by virtue of it. It's pure grace. Not because he needed all the grace. So it's celebratory. That's why we love to have a party. <laughs> and most parties end up in disaster. <laughs> because their lies and they're based on the lowest level of animal. So they say, who is going to be looked at long? It doesn't work. It's a mimicking something that is not in the right time, not in the right thing. But you're celebrating that whatever you've been given is by the same one. And they'll be taken away from you by the same one. And the same one tells you if they are taken away from you and the goodness remains in your heart, you will be given better than that which, is, mm. which you think has been taken away. I mean, what more is that? Then after that, you truly are singing the cosmic song, song inside. And wherever you are. And if you are leaving your body, things, that's the greatest gift. Next zone of consciousness, as the Quran says, that is real life. The hereafter is not something that's small little entity. It is life itself. So we are here being prepared for that zone of consciousness so that we really move into it without a great deal of agitation. And if we are going with a lot of burdens, stupidities, and anger, then there is the hell and the fire purification zone before we re-enter that zone. That's it. A simple, complete story of the human movement from the moment birth or pre-birth occurred to departure to the next. Perfection upon perfection. That's what the eye also says, nur ala nur. We can't improve that more and more. So what remains is to share it with those who are ready for that high obtained diet. Otherwise, it is useless. You have to 
help the children to grow in their numerous different levels, physical, biological, hormonal, chemical, until such time they're able to do their salah, which is top the mind, to present, be here without being anywhere. Then you tell them that's the truth. This is a gift from your own ruler in order to be ready for the zone of experience without a body or a mind and memory and all of it. That's the whole story. Once you accept it, live it, but there's no other way. That's why there's no choice. The illusion of choice is at the lower animal level. I can eat more, I can eat less. <laughs> Both ways I will suffer. But I still have to. Okay. In truth, there is no choice. Because you want the optimum, you want the best. And the nur of the light of your own room transmits what is the best. To refer back to it. But you can't talk to your ruh if you are in the cacophony of the noises of the lower self. You don't hear it. So you need to, by effort, by hard work, by doing your best, and by grace, touch that zone, utter perfection, which also gives life to the zone of reality of you. It takes to be honest, forceful, genuine, persistent to flow with nature. Mm -hmm. And this is higher. Nature. And that's all that it is. For that, you need friends. Mm -hmm. I find that the time we're living in, one of the biggest missing issues for sincere, serious, intelligent seekers, lack of true quality friends. I remember early days, I came across quite a lot of warning about that lack of friends. Mm -hmm. Or the danger of stupid or ignorant Sufis, or <laughs> people pretending to know. It's worse. How far worse? <laughs> yeah. Somebody's ignorant, is not good. you go eternally. If somebody's coming with all the paraphernalia of knowledge and so on, Reminds me of uh, Jaha. You know, he was, not many people could read or write. Somebody came to him, he had a big turban, this the village pool. He said, please read that for me. So Jaha looked at his turban. He said, I can't read it. So the fellow said, but you with such a big turban, you can't read. He said, all right, come. He took the turban off and put it on his head. He said, now you read. I can't read it. <laughs> so it's not by having yeah. big you know, dressing up and so on, I am the yeah. chief archbishop of the Times we're living in now has a lot of difficulties, a lot of stresses, a lot of challenges, but it's the best. Because you can't blame anybody else except this. You can walk anyway. You can leave your land of birth. hundred years ago, it was not possible. You would die if you leave the immediate tribe and so on. You can't survive. So, from the data point of view, the best of them. From no depending on others and so on, no, it's not difficult. There's no civil society. Everything is, you know, the fabric of connected people and their culture and their expectations is almost you know, the case. So, you know, look at the wonderful side, look at the great side of it. And past is the past is the past is the past. So the illusion of the great past is a romantic fantasy mm -hmm. in us. The great thing, the great work. No, you have seen few glimpses of friendship, generosity of an aunt or a grandmother. But look, they also have their, their issues more than any, any other time. Now, you have to wake up to the real you by turning away from the so-called you. You know, what I see sometimes is that um, what you mentioned, Sheikh, now that, you know, people are looking to the, the older 
as we say, religious rituals, religious titles, religious communities, uh, and projecting all of that on the outer, so to speak. And then some people are reacting against that. And this doesn't matter which religion you're talking about. They were raised as an ex. And so that ritual had, had ceased having any inner inner connection to this patita that we're talking about. And so they turned away from that. And so today we consider forms of religious rituals uh, have become suspect for many people. And for others, they hold on to only the outer form because they're afraid to let go of it because where will they be then? So this is what I see as a real challenge for today. Uh, is it possible to, again, quoting uh, Prophet Isa, Jesus, uh, is it possible to put the new wine into the old wineskins or do we need new wineskins? This is, this is a question for me personally. I don't know what you think about that. I think it's the new needs, the new equity. The wine or the skin may remind you, but the reality is that mm. if you have the attitude of presence, freshness, you would always experience the goodness of the divine moment. And incidentally, on that issue of how things deteriorate, this is the case with all formal, informal paths, religions, all of them. I was fascinated some time ago with certain part of the Buddhistic world mm -hmm. as to why are they so afraid. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't get through to that inner secret. It turned out that the rulers in that land had always invited the greatest known Buddhist master of the time to come and revive their being. Mm -hmm. So they all every 30, 40, 50 years they had a new master. Because so the teaching is the same. You know, do your best in the outer and trust in the rest, which is the highest. And so they maintained a living, if you like, Buddhist mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. It's not based on this type of wood. No, it ever changed. But remained, if you like, honest to the original everlasting teaching, mm. which is again duality. The outer is this world, you have to be fair, correct, honest, accountable, and the inner is beyond the limits, it belongs to another consciousness. So renewal is needed. Every day you, you wake up, fresh day, fresh opportunity. But at the same time, human being like to say, this is the oldest, we've been doing this for 600 years. <laughs> This tradition is now 300, 500 years, and, and it gives the illusion of continuity, mm -hmm. gives the illusion of eternity. It's an illusion. This is uh, the way we have done it like this. The Quran warns against it. Warns against, they say, why did you do this? They say, oh, this is how we find our ancestors. <laughs> they never, never, you never have the eye that says, no, it is wonderful how our ancestors do. Must have. Obviously, there was goodness in it and so on, but no. <clears throat> we love that which is eternal. That is the nature of the world. That is the nature of the divine transmission of life. It's a, it's a so then the rest, <clears throat> fresh, fresh, fresh. We love that new fashion, fashion. Now, today, the freshly milk. <clears throat> we bought fresh has just come from the unseen. <laughs> And that's continuous is ever present answer. You have to put it in perspective. I find, you know, even today in the in the outer world, you you have either the em emphasis on the new or preoccupation with the new, or you know, for instance, in our coffee company at home, we have on the on the bag of coffee they have since 2019, or <laughs> since it's okay, <laughs> so you've been around for five years because people love continuity, you see, or since 2010. Like, well, you know, 14 years, what's that? But the people love to know that they're connected to something that has right. some longevity. And, and even this comes into our, you know, the marketing or the food brand and things like this. Right. So you have these, this goal, for, you know, the absolute. And what's the ultimately new is what's new in the moment, which has to be that connection to the unseen, to say to the Lord. So 
I mean, Adnan, if I can turn back to you for a moment, sort of circling around the same issue. Uh, how do you see, you know, possibly Sharia changing and perhaps being, if you were to, if you were to come back in 100 years, what would, what would the Sharia look like? What would it feel like, so to speak? Well, this is, has, al has always been a challenge, as Sheikh said, the, between the traditional and the modern. I mean, we're always in that sense. What is the modern? What is the traditional? And, uh, uh, but it's much, for me, it has been much more deeper in my investigation. It has to do with the nature of reality, what we call so-called outer reality. I mean, st still in the mindset of the most, or the, is that there is an independent outer reality. Okay, you call it energy, matter, but somehow it's independent, and it's it's uh, and it is the real reality, kind of. And uh, <laughs> so, however, that's not the message of the Quran. I mean, that is not the outer reality is described as signs of the divine. Ayat. There's no facts in reality, even even so-called empirical, you know, especially in the modern times. What is real, you have to be empirical. You know, empirical evidence is what knowledge is. Empirical, yes, which is true in one dimension, which is greater, better than fictional, <laughs> better than simply uh, somebody said so a thousand years ago, because then it is emphasized verification that whatever somebody says has to be verified and all that. But again, that's the emphasis on the nature of form, form as something independent, something that has no... So therefore, okay, 400, they decided, oh, well, we don't need God anymore. Why? What's the, <laughs> we do everything ourselves. That's the God belongs to the, you know, the, the church and the mosque. But again, when you, when you lose the sense of the sacred, which is all there is, then... Uh, dependency becomes on this so-called empirical. And you, then we seek security in this reality that is, uh, of course, what has been shown is that the more you seek security in this, the more you become insecure. I mean, that's the nature of the modern world. There are more wars now in the name of security than ever. All the destruction around you is that somebody is seeking security and also... Uh, uh, superimpose it on some holy, holy, holy message. Mm -hmm. You know, it's always that kind. It's like you know, it has always been. You know, uh, Caesar needs the. <laughs> you know, it's always been this two kind of the. You 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 need the religious message in order for Pharaoh to you know assume power. And that's it. Is that this independence of I am, me, me and my uh, me and my and. Uh, but as uh, Sheikh Balwa said, how can this be secure? That you can Sharia in the outer sense can never lead. It's not about security. <laughs> it's about uh, in, uh, proper interaction, appropriate interaction in time and space. Again, uh, there was the idea of somehow absolutizing the Sharia, as in this is it. This is what we inherited. This is my the, what my ancestors did, and we carry on. Yes, but the, the time of the camel is different from the time of the rocket. I mean, it's not, I mean of course, the, the, the ethics, the morality, even that is gone because it's come now become upside down. But even the Prophet said there would be a come a time where you would see the, the, the ma'ruf becomes munkar, as in things go upside down. Because they, now instead of trusting in what is divine and what is permanent, you are trusting in your technology. So when that happens, you know, you have you become more insecure. You, there are more mental problems than anybody else because what can you trust? How can you trust the drugs, other people, even friends? Even the meaning of friendship has gone. <laughs> yeah. It becomes something purely when it's, uh, I mean, the relative is fine. This is the reality of duality. But even the meaning of relative, relative means there's a, re a reference to an absolute. Even science works this way. You cannot have a relative without some <laughs> reference to something that is fixed, otherwise it doesn't. It's like the shadows. Mm -hmm. This is a shadow play, but nobody asks, where's the light? <laughs> well, see, yes. some, you know, in your field also, some physicists, some scientists, they keep looking for, 
for this light in the smallest possible particle? Or, or are they looking out and say, well, the universe is X billion years older. Now, no, maybe it's older than that. So you're either looking for the smallest particle or the, the absolute, in terms of our time and space, beginning of the universe. And this keeps expanding. You know, there's no end to this. Yeah. Because when you're looking only on the outer, as you say, in this empirical reality, and okay, only from the standpoint of the individual self, as an office, it's called, um, where you're going to come to the end of that, basically. Uh, so where do you go once you come to the end? As I say, once you've painted the self into a corner, you just keep bumping your head into the corner. Or as you've mentioned, Adnan, you know, people escape through different substances, through drugs, through gambling, through this, through attaining more wealth and thinking that's going to be the end of things. So this, there's this sort of what I would call almost now an outer secular Sharia also. And it is the things you're mentioning, that only material reality exists and every person for him or her themselves, or whatever we're calling it now, uh, this sort of thing. And, and then this is all done in the name of religious principles that are called democracy or this or the free world or things like this. I mean, these have almost become quasi-religious concepts without any, you could say, uh, real interior meaning. I mean, what did democracy mean for the ancient Greeks? Well, it was a few men, you know, making decisions, you know, so to, even democracy itself changes its meaning over the period of time. And these different words like liberty and freedom, these, uh, these mean different things for different numbers of people. Free for whom? Free for how many? Uh, again, all this is done on the outer level without, let's say, seeking back to, okay, what is the source of, of my yearning for for freedom, for equality, for rights, for right living, or you could say a, a sense of an adab, a way of living with other people uh, that is sustainable, that's, that really is satisfying. And uh, this is what I see as a difficult challenge for the age. And uh, I think, uh, you know, circling back a bit to our project also, hopefully there's some inspiration for, for people here to see how you can take something that came through in a particular time, in a particular place from an eternal source. Let's say, you know, when it came at the time of Prophet Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, something that came from this source, and then how, you know, how it can be knit into the fabric of today's reality to again open doorways for, you know, for back to that light. I mean, I keep re reflecting on. You know, there's a there's a theory, although I'm not partial to the theory, uh, where in the Sufi realm, uh, people combine Freud's psychoanalysis with the beautiful names, the Asma Husna. And so the theory is, as I understand it, that we're all full of holes in our in ourself, our nafs. And these these holes uh, are, are felt as holes, and so we need to to plug the Asma husna into these holes to heal the self. And on one level, that's very good. But on the other level, we're just adapting the self and we become, it's all about the self. It becomes all about the self, the self, the self, my path, myself, my view, and all of these sorts of things. Whereas, you know, why not just accept the holes as they are? And let's say that each hole fits one of these beautiful names that the Quran offers us. And then just look at the light through the hole rather than trying to plug the hole and close the window. You know, it's wouldn't wouldn't that be a lot easier? I mean maybe just my point of view, I don't know, a scoff for a lot. Uh, you know, Shaykhna, the, the Quran presents us with, I would say, a very usable map of reality for today. A very practical map. And I wonder if you could you could speak a little bit about that. وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّاهَا فَأَلْهَمَهَا فِجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا And how this nafs, Quran uses this word nafs for a wide range of meaning, mm -hmm. starting from the ruh and, and with the other end of it is the nafs al-ammara, it's the, the lower nafs, the animal self. So Quran says, how is this nafs being brought about? 
necessary in this zone of reality. If there is a ruh, the divine, which is absolute, which transmits everything, knows everything, timeless. So its echo, its shadow is the next. And then the Quran says, so this net can be the most rebellious, the most destructive, and it can be the most obedient, submissive delight. And that means it's given up itself when under the cloak, under the guidance of the rule. So it becomes mutta. So it don't denounce the self, change it. Make it subservient to its master, to its origin, to the world. Otherwise, it's me, me, me. So I, I, I want the whole world to be under me. Mm -hmm. That is where the whole thing will be destroyed. So, it is not to denounce it. The next is a big treasure. It leads us to the world. By it disappearing, comes near to the light of the room, and there is no more shadow. The light of the room. So suffering from the next early on, me, 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 I want it all, I want it all. All right, take it, and then you find you're unpopular, or you don't want it. Now that you want it to be, you know, loved by the others. So it's instead of taking, taking, you start giving, 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 giving. Until a point comes that you realize that no, there is still a little bit of your animal still there. So give and take. Give more than take. Be more generous. Sana, sana, sana. Be more. It has to be real. Initially, no, I want it all. Then you find everybody will run away from you and you end up with a lot of decaying food or whatever you want. A time will come and now I want to give it all the year. And you sit bereft and nobody cares anymore. They've taken it and gone. The real thing is the balance. No. Give more than that which you do. And be willing to be without and so on. Let be patient. Meaning stop time. Your soul, your root is not in time. So enter your soul. And what if you die? The big liberation. If you have gone into another zone where there is no space and no time. You have to read and live with the multidimensional reality that you are. Otherwise, it becomes this very low level animal surviving, procreating. But we have come a long way. This is not, this is not, you know, 10 million years ago. We yeah. are not 5 million years ago. We are now. It's amazing the flowering of the Rise in consciousness, rise in intelligence, yeah, just in the last three, four thousand years. Incredible across the board. Just look at the gender issue, how abusive we have been regarding the feminine gender you know, for thousands of years. But look at it now. So we are very fortunate in having that new strong entry into humanity by the feminists. They brought in a great deal of wealth and and better, if you like, fairness and justice and so on. So if you are in the moment, then you won't change it for any other time. You truly are celebrating the lens of the moment to which you see it then. You're not yearning back for the past at all. No, there is no such thing. The past is only to do with some biographical notion that doesn't exist. It has had its effect upon whatever there is, including, you know, a human being. But it has changed, it's gone. Anchoring after the past is an illusion that describes not being content with the present. That means you are denying the divine presence. You are divine, de denying the presence of divine grace. Now, past past. No, it. it existed, yes, in the zone of space and time, yes. Your soul has no past, has no future, it's ever present. Your life 
is only part of eternal life. Once you say my life, then you're not only a usurper, you're a liar because it's not you. You belong to it. It doesn't belong to you. Life is life. It's part of eternal life. It's divine. It's a mystery. Accept it and live it and be ready to celebrate it joining the zone of timelessness, not being caught for a while in the zone of reality as it is now. Mm -hmm. That's it. It is um, this hankering after the past is a current theme, by the course, in, in our culture. In that, you know, people want to uh, they identify not only with to say not not only with their own self, but let's say the self of my group, we call the group dogs. And we want to make X group great again. If we were great in the past. But you know, no one talks about, well, we'd like to all go back to Newton, you know, and, and just live with Newtonian physics anymore, because they'd have to, you know, their handies and you know, their mobile phones would disappear and, and television, you know, all these things, you know, and food would start to decay and and on and on and on. So, uh, Adnan, I'm wondering how you see this because your deep background in Quran and also in in physics and science. I mean, do you see that there's this can be a way for some people through you could say this new approach to physics, new approach to cosmology, uh, the, these sorts of things. Does this provide some hope? Some you could say some bolstering for what Sheikh has talked about is this rise of intelligence is what we're coming to. Yes, I do. I think, but again, as Shekhna said, it is, you know, the, uh, uh, there's, depending on intention, is there genuine intention to go there? As I said, if, if, if the animal life is what people, you know, if everybody's content with, I mean, that's what even the Quran said. Nothing but for most people, nothing but boasting and basically inflating the ego. <laughs> so, so, but there will always be the, the, somebody who's genuine. There is always, it's again, uh, the level of consciousness and the level of things. So, for me, as I said, that for example, even trying to understand the nature of space and time. Just this sensory, what we call, you know, uh, you know, you're not you know, talking about some other, we're talking about this present life, because that's what the Quran directs us in the beginning. It says, well, sir kul siru fil ard, you know, try and understand this reality. What is it? What's its nature? I mean, even modern science, as I said, that does help for, because for, uh, in terms of the, the essence of science is to truly with the best intention, understand our reality and our place in it, where we're coming and we're going. So, I mean, the, now we, we have the understanding that space and time has no reality outside uh, the human observer, for example, because we cannot say, we cannot be outside of our own consciousness to say what it is, right? So the nature of the physical reality has no time, for example. Can we, do we really understand the implication of that, right? So without, for example, without memory, I have no time. There is no time. Yeah. So time is to do with memory. And what is memory is like a snapshot of galleries that are stored. Well, how did these come about? These come about because of the act of observation or measurement, they call it. But simply by, by having... Uh, a conditioned observer, you have time. And space is in a similar way. Space has sort of the three-dimensional space. It's just because to do again, it's an artifact of perception. So, you know, why is space three-dimensional, four-dimensional? There's no such thing. Scientifically, there's no limits. Uh, when mathematician describes space, can go to infinity. No, there's no limit to that. So again, it is our uh, the nature of conditioned consciousness, the nature of the necessity, as Shem have said, is that how can the absolute be known, or how can it's only through the relative, or or 
or the quality, let's say the qualities of the absolute, you can't say the absolute can be known, but that, then that becomes a, a dual. It is that the qualities that we know of, all of us, again, it's present. Why do we, whatever we do is because of certain qualities, whether it's wealth, health, or anything. That can only happen in the in the nature of this limited conditioned experiences that we call that becomes ingrained as a self. This becomes my biography, and again, it's very linked to memory. I mean, without memory, all reality is <laughs> is totally insane. But you can't function without memory. But that's time. Again, do we have that understanding that time has no independent reality? Our that's why, as you know, ancestors has no meaning except the memory. <laughs> has no, neither the future is only a projection. It is again a virtual reality. Here is what the meaning of khayal. So we are always constantly living in this virtual reality, which is also necessary for life. Otherwise, there will be never be any you know future development and all that. Especially nowadays, where this idea of artificial intelligence is coming in, because neither it's I mean, but, but nobody can tell you what intelligence is. <laughs> so, so all of this is meaning that somehow we want something to mimic us. But that's been happening for hundreds of years. Machines have been replacing human beings because they're more efficient and less fickle, <laughs> and that will continue. But that brought to me the other side is that what is the nature of the nafs? If we can mimic this thing in terms of a data structure, which is really a biography, then isn't the nafs nothing but that, an artificial bi <laughs> bi uh, story that is to do with the, with the time and space? It's, it's embedded in, the time, in time and space. So yeah. that's what AI is doing. It's selecting, sampling. Yeah. Which is basically memory, and then yes. passed into the future, and so there's no present, let's say. And so yes, yeah, so it's it is a story. It's a story, and, and yeah, exactly. And and, and again, if 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 we see uh, the nefs, especially the basic lower, nothing but an artificial made up thing, then should be able to say, well, I can let that go. <laughs> then it doesn't matter. Then I should look for, well, is there an essence to us then? Or is it just a, a, but again, the relative cannot happen without the absolute. Yeah. Then, then there was a, then there can be a genuine necessity to look, to ask these questions and look inwards in a sense, not just what I'm observing. Okay. What is my, the observer? What is the nature of consciousness itself? And, and because, say, who's observing the observer, so to speak? So who's, Who's collapsing our way? I mean, who is because yeah, it's it's like mirrors in, in, in front of each other. Well, it's a, it's an again, it's that uh, yes, exactly. What is the nature? Because whatever we can speak of, whatever we can describe, is uh, in terms of measurement. Again, going back empirical reality. But the more you delve into your inner reality, that you find that it cannot be measured, because it's always the observer of what is observed, and that can be a doorway. As in, ask yourself, as in, وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَاهَا فَأَلْهَمْهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا. You know, we have within us some that can have the can go both ways, or can. Uh, but again, what is the essence of that? And then has to be a genuine, authentic, you know, really sincere intention to find that out. Otherwise, I'm chasing shadows and I'm happy with my inflating my ego. That's it. <laughs> I mean, this yeah. is coming into sort of education that is even early education, because this is where the, some of these questions would need to be how do would need to be raised, or we could say that. You know, we we know we, we we believe we know that outer reality, what we call outer reality, um, only appears, only becomes what some people have called phenomena, due to the way that we perceive it. So, what is what is it that is perceiving through us? It can't be the brain because the brain is another perception. You know, the brain is another thing, so to speak. So, there has to be something else. 
to, which we can touch, which we can, what we say, we recalibrate to use the current term to reconnect. And uh, for, do, you, do you see any, any possibility for this coming into, you could say, general public con consciousness? Well, I mean, again, if it, if things happen in spite of us. <laughs> Let's have a wonderful things of happening in spite of us, as it's like now artificial intelligence become mainstream. Everybody's doing something to do with that. And then once you have that critical mind, then then again the question of, so what are we then? If we can be replaced by machines or not, then what are we then? What are we so doing? there has to be genuine questioning of that. And the most kind of the 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 uh, most. The, a lot of the senior scientists who came through that are coming through that. These people who worked with computers and because of, there was the idea of making uh, kind of generating somehow consciousness through computing. But they came through the, the conclusion that's not possible because we're kind of looking everything in the wrong way. So they're redefining the whole uh, idea of of the uh, uh, there, there is more than the empirical and the observable. And uh, the more these uh, become more mainstream and become more as in any, any student, any undergrad will have to do some computing. And these questions will come up. You cannot escape them. I mean, uh, quantum physics is too specialized, for example. This has been there for 100 years, but only maybe still a few. But yeah. when something comes to, the, or to your desktop, <laughs> you know, to your mobile phone, you cannot ignore that anymore. You have to put, raise these questions. And uh, I think that's, there is a, in spite of us again, in spite of us. Because the more there's destruction, means even, even in the divine wisdom, fitna is a way to, you know, a wake up call. You know, the more you see the, the destruction in the world, people ask, well, why does God, uh, well, he tells you in the Quran, you know, the fitness has always been there. The more you seek security in the wrong place, the more you, you will fall into your own, uh, you know, testing times. And then maybe you start to wake up. Maybe you will ask now, meaning return or refer to the to what is really essential, timeless, and you cannot find it in time because time is something made up. <laughs> You know, we make up time as we go along. It's only through the window of conditioned consciousness. So if I'm looking through the window of conscious consciousness, then again, who is looking? They can only be as Sami al-Basir. Quran says, why, why does he always go back? Wahu as Sami al-Basir, or he, he is the wise, he is. That means there's a refer to that. Constantly urge your own, constant reference to the to these qualities that are not in time, that are not belong to me and you. It is only we are an agency of those. Abdullah, Abdullah, ultimately very challenging word in the in the Quran. Again, people think, oh, we know that Abdullah. What does that mean? <laughs> what does it mean? <laughs> who do you think you are kind of thing so uh, again it's you know, we have that uh, constant challenge balance but ultimately there's only one way <laughs> now, can you give what you can share with us Kiram and Khatibi Does that mean referring to the, the, the angel, the angelic? Of the events and the ever moving time, it gets erased. But Kiram and Katibin, that this is the intermediate zone from which Khayal emerges and leads us or misleads us. Kiram and Katibin, the angelic zones in which whatever I intended or whatever I did remains for a while resonating influencing and so on and it isn't the so the 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 intermediate zone between the dual consciousness of human beings and the supreme supra consciousness 
there are these in between which we call the angelic realm. And the Quran does dwell on this, that they, they write what we are doing. It's written. Hmm. In a sense, it, it's there is a zone in which there is a record of these uh, movements in time and space as well. So who are I think, yeah, you? I, mean, I, think I think, yeah, I mean, for me, as uh, the more we understand the nature of time and space as an ether, ether means a trace. Hmm. So then you understand if it's a trace, then it goes back to the qalab, you know. Mm. You know, you know, has to go back to the pen. There is a writing that we do not see. What we see is the effect. Again, it's upside down reality. We see, we assume this is an independent reality. The laws of it is, is happens all in time and space. But the reality of it, this is the the effect, not the cause. And there are layers of causes. It's like we are in a multi-dimensional, because we are, uh, our observation is within four dimensions. Of course, naturally, if something is in another dimension, it cannot be seen. You can only see its effects. Then you have to ask, well, where, where are these things? But again, a lot of these uh, understandings is people still look for these or understanding in terms of, of a physical thing, as if, okay, the one says, up high up they look up as if you know you know the quran came down from outer space but the meaning of tanzil the meaning of is a much deep much higher uh, it's a much higher level of consciousness it's not a level of material <laughs> so again it's that going in the depth of our own of the human psyche the, you have these energies Kayal cannot happen independent of us, that, that virtual reality, which is a reality of all possibilities, where all these uh, written, I don't know whether it's called, you can call it archetypes of Kiram and Katibin, and, as in the, the, the writing of the divine signs within the human soul or self. I mean, that's how I, and it is, where do you look for these? Where do you, I mean, these are realities that the Quran mentions. But they can only mean they cannot just be fictional, as in they has to be real to me and you and everybody. Otherwise, they remain something. Oh yeah, the, but you know because we are stuck in living in our little material self, these don't have no meaning except like okay, you put something on the wall. <laughs> but there are energies that are impacting us all the time. Whether it's you know malaika, jinn, and all that various energies that are can be harmful, can be useful, can be, but that, you know, as you say, katibin means there's a there's a, a resonance, there are patterning going on that that maybe even you know ca we carry it with us even towards the barzakh because that's another zone of purification. Or uh, so these patterns are there, and that's why whatever we do here counts. That's the meaning of accountability. Otherwise, what are you accountable for? All these different realms. Yeah, as you, as you yes, know. I mean, yeah, the Quran is, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I was just talking about the Quran is the book of the human being, and it's all these is reflecting all everything within us. Otherwise, it's becomes an abstract thing, you know, you just, uh, you know, it's a nice thing, you have thawab, <laughs> but has no real, has no living reality. And the, until we understand all these nuances of the Quran that is talking about us, it's, it's uh, because it's, uh, the treasure has been all, has been entrusted within the Khalifa. And the Khalifa's role is to to embody, enact, live these energies, realities, reflecting ultimate uh, the divine. Go on, we want to listen to you forever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, forever is a 
We so, all love, love forever. <laughs> no, it's just, it's, it is a vibration that takes us to the source of all of creation. That's why. Well, back to your theme of the, you know, the way that the AI may raise some of these questions about who we really are. Again, this, this circles back to uh, if, if we are not the same as a robot, and, you know, with, even with all the various films out about, well, if you let uh, AI take over, you could end up in a total disaster. And various scientists have said that. So if, if we're not that, how do we live? Who are we and how do we live? So these two basic questions still resurface. Uh, and, and again, it seems to me that this is the way the Quran keeps directing us, directing us. Even though things were not as complex outwardly, at the time of Prophet Muhammad, they were complex enough. And that, again, is circling back to, you know, who, who are we really and how do we live? How do we reconnect so that we become who, you could say, more of who we really are? And then how do we navigate, negotiate this individual life, the Nafs life, together with the rule? And so it's not just about you could sort of dividing, okay, this is Nafsi and this is Ruhani, you know, because they interpenetrate in a certain way. The, the Ruch, uh, in, you could say, empowers the Nafs. It wouldn't exist without it. So they're, they're, they're entangled in, in a certain way that almost is, again, used in, in physics these days so that people can you know, understand what entanglement means. You can distinguish two things without necessarily saying that they are separate. And there's some, you could say, them some clear dividing line between them that can always be said, okay, this is the dividing line. Maybe the dividing line changes in a particular situation, in a particular, for a particular person. Okay, for one person, this may be, you could say, Nazi. This could be, you know, too selfish, too material. Uh, for another person, it could be the right thing that leads them back to, say, the home of their soul. You know, it's, you know, I would I would hope that some of these questions uh, do eventually percolate into popular culture and into education, no matter what tradition a person may be raised in or how they may be raised. And it could be that these things are happening, as you say, without our uh, certainly without our activity, without our, our conscious input. But, you know, ultimately we don't know. Uh, Quran says, Wallahu baligun amra. You know, ultimately the, the divine project is, uh, will be fulfilled. <laughs> I mean, this whole, as it says, this illusion is all us, you know, we, uh, we are all deceiving ourselves into being, you know, these individuals, but it's ultimately the divine uh, uh, kind of deception through us in order to for that project to be fulfilled. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> It's a, it's this, it's, uh, again, it's a, both a challenge, but can be a celebration, can be, but only if you see the perfection yeah. uh, of the totality. Even Genesis talks about this. We circle back to Hebrew scripture. I mean, we are, you know, in the desert, biblical scholars pointing out in Hebrew, we're imbued with what's called salem, salem. With the TZ sort of sound at the beginning, which is translated as the divine image. So this is image is also a shadow as it's clarified. Um, it's a Hidebutemu and it's a Salomenu, as it says in Genesis. So uh, we understand as the as the self gets more self, more selfy, so to speak, that's become more materialized, that this solemn becomes solemn in the Quran, and it's it becomes foolishness or it becomes darkness. So we, we it's it's both both and uh, and even without using religious language, I mean perhaps there's some way that this can be understood simply uh, in schools, um, you know, in, in families, which is maybe even more important than schools, that you have a choice, your individual, there are individual choices to be made. And so, you know, look at the alternatives. You look at what could happen if such and such happens, or this happens, or that happens. And, uh, decide, you know, who who really you, you are in the sense of a, 
a connection to an eternal soul, you could say you're an eternal being uh, on one level, on, on one part of your being, and how how does that affect how you live, how, how you behave and, and deal with other people? Yeah. If at all, do you have any final words for us or we finish this, this session? It's really what I live by, and that is be in the moment. Do what you can without overwhelming yourself in fear, anxiety, guilt, trust. And it's perfection upon perfection, as Adnan says, for Andre assures us, in the law by the Amr. What is the order? What is the design? What is the will of God to be known? How? Through worship, through adoration, through being in awe, through yielding, being more and more and more in the now until you stop time. That moment from which time emerges is eternal. Be in that. And then don't deny also the movement of time or a bit of a memory or but less and less and less emphasis on what you did last year or what I did yesterday or what, how I went wrong. It doesn't matter. What matters is that the soul or the spirit that gives you life is on a short exposure to this zone of consciousness of duality. So at best, I am a host. At best, I am a housekeeper for this earth. At best, I am in charge of the accommodation for the soul, which is my body, mind. So that is the only durable reality that I have access to. So there is an unknown spirit, this gives me life, and the so-called I, the nefs, the ego, the, is there in order to make sure <coughs> that I am helping to create an ambience that is acceptable to this divine plane or soul or spirit, for it not to leave too soon, for it to leave in the right path, having been exposed to the end. So I have a bit of a duty. It's a participative destiny. My role is to be aware and don't, don't make too much mistake, be loyal to my source of life. That's it. Thank you, Sheikh Thank, Thank you, Arnon. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Leia, for the project. <laughs> and uh, hopefully we will find its way to whoever's hearts are open and can receive this eternal message. And, uh, more than the message in words, it's the message in the unseen that we sense within us is this eternal life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.